All right, so welcome everyone. I am Laura Morrison, past president of WCA. And today for one of our second Saturday sessions, we have Detroit, or Woman House Detroit, The Art of Being Female in America. And so without further ado, I'd like to turn this over to our current president, Donna Jackson, uh, to get us rolling. Thank you, Donna. You are welcome. I'm so excited to see my peeps all here um, representing for Women Caucus of Art. Um, so as Laura said, this is the second Saturday and the, we're presenting um, Women House Detroit, which is an exhibition that started last year, September um, as a, so let's, let's go back beyond that, like 40 years ago, 50 years ago, um, there was an exhibition called Woman House that happened in California as a uh, a a way for a, a place for women to safely uh, create and exhibit around our narratives of women, and it's also around other things, meaning the the feminist movement, um, art and feminism, and academics. Um, Laura Earl will go into deeper. I'm really just like touch pointing here, but um, with everything that was going on in the last few years, especially while we were in COVID, we saw a lot of the inequities that were happening racially and with gender and uh, just things just fell into place to where this was a good time for our a city of Detroit, where I'm from, to develop something that spoke to both of those things and um, to amazing women brought on 11, 12, 13, 14 other amazing women to create what is now known as um, Women House Detroit. So with that being said, right now you see, you'll see several of us from the exhibition here that will talk today, mainly um, uh, the two curators of Asia Hamilton and Laura Earl, and then um, the rest of us artists, me, myself included, we, we will chime in and tell you how great and, and life-changing experience has been. But from there, I would like to introduce first friend, um, fellow Detroiter, amazing woman, um, Asia Hamilton, also owner of no um, the owner of Norwest Gallery um, Arts. So Asia, I'm turning it over to you. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, I am, like she said, I'm the owner of Norwest Gallery of Art. I'm also an artist myself with a medium in fine art photography. Um, lately, I've been shooting, well, actually, I've been shooting uh, environmental photography for like all my uh, existence, but mostly uh, as of late, I've been shooting a lot of landscapes and stuff like that. But I, I want to say that because I feel like I've gotten so far removed from my art <laughs> because I've been so focused on curating and uh, running the gallery and now uh, running Woman House. So um, a little bit about why I started Woman House, um, because um, once I graduated from college, uh, you know, I had a, my major was in alternative processing and, you know, it was really a you know a fine art photography field and um i didn't know what to do with that i didn't really know how to present myself to galleries or um in any way i mean even though we had like a, an exit class that'll help you get your resume together and get your portfolio together but they didn't really tell you like how to um really approach these galleries and get your work out there so i was kind of getting shut down left and right. I was living in Chicago at the time and um, I needed a, I needed to have a mentor or have some guidance. Um, so I ended up working at the Disciple Museum. Well, before that, I was working at the Museum of Contemporary Photography in the curatorial department. Then I worked at the Disciple Museum um, in the curatorial department. And um, both times, I'm still not, I'm like, I'm seeing what people are submitting, but I'm not really quick. I'm not really figuring out the formula. So 
Um, at that point, you know, I, you know, that those jobs ended and I moved back to Detroit and I got into doing photojournalism because I needed a job. So I, I say all of that um, um, because my whole purpose in having an, a, a, an artist residency is to provide a space for, you know, women artists to be able to um, have that mentorship so that they can uh, know the steps and to have a platform to display their work and exhibit, you know, exhibit themselves, you know, as themselves, you know? Um, I would go to these different galleries and they'd be like, oh, well, we only focus on abstract or you only have to, we only have, we only deal with established artists with that's, you know, pieces that are 5,000 and up, which was, that's what, that was expensive back then. Now that's like, oh, that's the low ball right there, right? Um, now, you know, so, you know, this, they, it was like all of these various different things. And, and, and I found myself trying to switch my style or do this particular thing or, or whatever I could do in order to try to fit to, so that I could be in these various different spaces. Well, my whole purpose and, and wanting to do a residency is to have a space where I, that would be my table where I can invite people to come and have a seat at the table. And it won't be so much um, racism or sexism or, um, you know, or, or any of those things that, you know, that held us back. It'll be a table of love, you know, mm -hmm. and encouragement. So um, I, uh, you know, my mom passed. Uh, she, you know, she had COVID and um so did i <laughs> and my mom passed and you know she she has already you know been living she wasn't living in the house for a while so i i had the house for a long time but i knew that i didn't want to stay here am i frozen yeah <laughs> Look at you, but we like <laughs> all right well anyway <laughs> that's weird stop it Okay, it didn't do it. So, all right. So, um, uh, sometimes so mom, Asia, if you actually turn your camera off and then on, oh, it's it's okay now. But oh, sometimes okay. that can help. There you go. <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, so I knew that I didn't want to stay uh, at the house because I mean we've been over here forty four years. So like I just knew that I didn't want to live at the house indefinitely, and. Um, you know, and I knew that I wanted to create these opportunities for women artists, particularly women artists of color um, for this space. So um, I started telling Laura about it. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I want to do have some, you know, like a residency here at the house. And then they'll be able to also assist me at the gallery as well. And, you know, Laura had already uh, did a whole house exhibit, you know, a woman house in Manchester. Uh, which was a, a fabulous and absolutely amazing, beautiful home. Um, I didn't get a chance to get there, but just the just the photos and from what I saw was just amazing. Um, but she suggested that we do a woman house Detroit here at at you know at my childhood home. Now originally I was like I don't know because the house in Manchester was massive. Okay. I was like, I don't think we could do it in this little baby house. You know what I'm saying? Like my house is, it's only like 1600 square feet. So like, I don't think that it would be big enough, but you know, um, she saw the vision and um, we started brainstorming on artists that we could include, you know. Um, I definitely, you know, uh, thought of some, uh, you know, some really dope artists off the rip that are some of my uh, favorite installation artists and invited them and so did uh so did um laura and uh donna uh, suggested people uh to come and be a part of this amazing experience um and that's what we did we came together um we we you know discussed ideals and experiences and um and poured that energy into our work and um I'm grateful for the whole experience. It was um, 
it was very touching, not just for me, but also for my community. And um, let me see, hold on a second. Oh, now I'm getting a spinning wheel. That means that the spirits are with us. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you lately, the veil is thin. <laughs> so the- um, That's the nicest yeah. interpretation I've ever heard of this. <laughs> <laughs> It is. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so uh, that, you know, was a beautiful experience, but not just for me, but for the community as well, because they had never seen anything like that in this community. You know, um, we, nobody knows, who, it's so funny too, because the moment that we did this, it seemed like the artists started to come out their houses. Like, you know, people who was showing up like, oh, I'm an artist too. I found out that my next door neighbor has been a photographer for, uh, I think it was Ford Motor Company since like the sixties or something. And I'm like, what? You know, like Mr. Wooten, you know, like, I didn't know. I was like, did you know I'm a photographer? Like weird, you know, but it, it was just an opportunity for the community also to come together and experience uh, this art and also um, experience what, you know, what these women have gone through um, in their in their lives and and relate to it in their own way. So um, that's a little bit about, you know, how the idea came about and um, we'll pass it on to Laura. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Asia. that was a great summary. <laughs> uh, yeah, as Asia said, um, you know, the, this whole idea of doing a whole art installation featuring exclusively women artists um, was really a groundbreaking idea dating back to 1972 in Los Angeles. And that first woman house was headed up by two uh, now famous artists, Judy Chicago and Miriam Shapiro. And that whole situation was because uh, they were trying to launch a, a feminist art program in college and their facility wasn't available. So they ended up taking over a house. And what it did is it opened up this amazing opportunity for women, not only to learn skills of um, what it would take to renovate a house, which are also very handy sculpture skills, for example, but also gave them a platform to discuss, you know, their uh, experience as women at a moment when there was a tremendous amount of pressure to remain in a domestic setting. Um, and in that moment, because of that particular location and that particular population, um, you know, we got to see young white women um, in 1972 and what they were dealing with in first wave feminism. Fast forward, um, just about 50 years later, I'm in grad school learning about this first project. And all I wanted to know is, you know, if we did this today, what would women be making work about? You know, what's changed? What's different? You know, what kinds of voices are there today that, you know, what would they be saying? So eventually um, we gathered, like Asia was saying, in Manchester, Michigan, and we transformed in 2018 uh, a 3,400 square foot house into a, a whole house art installation. And as I was working with the artists in that iteration, um, it became important to me to really have the artists be uh, from a variety of ages, backgrounds, ethnicities. I wanted it as diverse um, and broad and experienced you know, represented as possible. And so we did that first, that first iteration. And then as Asia said, um, when she wanted to launch Woman House Detroit, I was all about it. So I have a slide presentation of almost all the work. I'm missing a couple of pieces, but almost all the work from Woman House Detroit. So I'm gonna share the screen and share the amazing work that was done just last year, even though it's it's hard to believe that it's only been a year, but it, it has. So let me put this in play mode. Awesome. So um, what you're seeing here, and I, I have to ask for just a second, do you see the full screen or do you also see the little windows of people watching? Both. I also see the little the people watching on the okay, so I think it depends on how each person has their Yeah, stuff. it's not about you, it's about what people yeah. want. 
you okay. can go up so. to everyone can go up to view at the top of at the top and you could do view speaker um, yeah awesome awesome so um i i was always wondering about that because i wanted to make sure that you can see all the art here um so uh i am really honored to present the survey of the artwork from this inaugural exhibition at woman house detroit it was such a pleasure curating it and we all together had uh, 14 women artists from a really wide um, background uh, from many cultures and ages and together we transformed asia's girlhood home in northwest detroit uh, into an all house art installation and all the artists were collaboratively using a combination of consciousness raising techniques and brainstorming um, we often met over zoom uh, we did have some in-person meetings and of course once installation started um, the house became this wonderful hub of activity um, so here's some examples of of some of our artists installing their work. Um, and in, in just so many ways, it became an, this nexus of womanism meets feminism. Uh, the house was in good shape. So our installations really were primarily focused on the artwork and the aesthetic considerations. We weren't bogged down like the original um, woman house project by you know actually having to repair much on the house at all. So um, some of the... Uh, the installations were really quite ad adventurous. Um, what you're seeing here on the right is a framework for one of the more architectural installations. Um, in the little inset, there's a, a lot of multiples involved with the 72 feathers piece. Um, Laura Lee Byatt there installing her beautiful fractured installation in the front windows of the home. And then when it was time to open the exhibit, we held a ceremony in protest of the SB8 legislation. Um, and we installed these signs out front of the house uh, and you'll see the round deputy stickers. We used um, those stickers to deputize each of the visitors to the exhibit. And as soon as you walked into the front door, um, you're, you would be standing in a narrow entryway and we covered the walls in bounty posters surrounding a piece called Hanger Monster. Um, Hanger Monster in, was garbage bags lining the coat closet and a single red flashlight, which lit a cascade of white wire hangers spilling out onto the floor. So front and center, we had um, the eroding women's rights right there at the beginning of our conversation because of everything that we've been encountering in this past year it was important to, to say where we stood. And then once you opened up the door, you would step into the living room and front and center, you would see a wide range of different artworks dealing with issues of resilience. Um, we had pieces about overcoming childhood neglect, uh, family alcoholism, um, resilience with regard to the climate crisis and wanting to leave a better legacy for future generations. We had um, grieving loved ones lost to COVID. And in this piece, Memorial Transformations, Iranian artist Sitara Gorishi addressed consumer culture and the freedom that she has here in the US to dress as she pleases. Her favorite garments are stretched over shipping boxes that they came in. Noting the way her clothing had become infused with memories, this collection has sort of an anecdotal aspect. Rosa Maria Zamarone activated the kitchen with colorful paperworks and an energetic soundscape of her mother and aunties and other women in the family and friends chatting away as they cooked. Learning to cook from the women in her family was a cultural rite of passage into womanhood for Rosa. And she embraced the kitchen as a place to reclaim her cultural heritage from the interference of colonizers. She notes, we choose whether to silence our ancestral calling or to reclaim what was taken, heal the pain and trauma and honor our ancestors. And I just wanna point out while I'm on this slide, um, you'll note in the top left slide, there is a beautiful red set of pathways that Rosa drew on the ceiling. And she was connecting the doorway, which um, is made of paper marigolds. And, and there was this wonderful experience as you parted those, that curtain of marigolds. It really made this, um, 
this amazing transformation transition between the two spaces. It really felt like you were entering into just this whole other way of thinking about the world. And the red flowers across the ceiling connect between the entrance to the kitchen and the entrance to the dining room. And the dining room was done um, by another Latina artist, Amelia Duran. And uh, so here is what the dining room looked like. And this piece was called Becoming Fia Sagra, which means uh, becoming hinges. And it addressed uh, Amelia's sense of hinging two cultures, being flexible yet fixed, uh, identifying with both the oppressed and the oppressor. Amelia points to the varying levels of generational migration histories of binational females in America and life experiences shaped by a juxtaposition of two very different cultural and political realities. And then on the front and back porches outside the house, we had um, some more installation pieces. Um, Rosa activated the back patio with posters and flyers of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Wheat pasted to the cement porch floor, they decayed in the elements and they were positioned so that you couldn't leave the house without stepping on their faces. The front and the back porches were activated by Asia Hamilton in a two-part installation. The festive front-facing porch speaks to the romantic fantasy of falling in love, with, which is installed in, instilled in women from a very young age who are taught to, to really pursue this. And you'll note that there's a broom on the bench there um, as a reference to jumping the broom, uh, African-American tradition in, in wedding ceremonies. But on the back porch and the privacy of the backyard, um, a very different idea is expressed. Um, the evolution from romantic idealism into the reality of an intimate relationship once the veil of new love falls away. So this is the awakening, the second part of that same piece. And then moving a little further into the backyard was a sculptural garden installation by Leslie Sobel called I'm Still Here. It was made of found wood, which emerged from a planting of native species. At the top was a ghostly face of metal mesh suggesting a woman's form. Having reached the age of invisibility, she was pushing back, insisting that women over 50 are still here, still vibrant, still growing. And then back inside the house, um, the stairway itself was activated by a piece called 72 Feathers by Aaron Gold. Viewers did the work of ascending the stairs as they emerged and engaged with the stained feathers, stained glass feathers hanging from a large oval mirror on the ceiling. Developed during the isolation and loss of the COVID pandemic, themes of eternity, loss, and hope were all intermingled in this artwork culminating with a fluttering collection of gilded tags at the landing, each with a handwritten description of a personal loss or in some way letting go. The house contained two memorial spaces, uplifting the memory of loved ones lost in the pandemic. On the left is an alcove at the base of the stairway where a candle burned amid shards of broken glass to honor those lost by the woman house artists. And at the top of the stairway was a gilded bookshelf offered to the community as a place to honor their loved ones with paper mementos they could leave behind. Sabrina Nelson focused on an art as medicine in her bathroom installation called the Apothecary. It was a fragrant bath filled with flowers and was surrounded by a collection of medicine cabinets featuring colorful drawings and phrases as a celebration of how generations of women in her family have used natural remedies, herbs, encouragement, beauty, and hope to heal themselves and their families. In the hallway opposite is Olivia Guterson's Constellation of Home, a tribute to the women in her family who raised her and the female ancestors who continue to guide her. At the end of the hall, the cedar closet was activated by Melanie Manos in a video installation called Rockabye. She explores the precarity women face in the workplace. The video shows Melanie dressed in restrictive professional attire while attempting to climb a violently rocking ladder. 
Melanie and I collaborated on this installation called Economic Stimulus. Melanie was reading about the glass ceiling index and noticed the shape of the wage gap between men and women formed a phallus. She 3D printed the infographic as a series of dildos, noting you might as well enjoy yourself while getting screwed over. We worked together on the branding and packaging to address a variety of jobs that women perform. Notably, the caregiver box is empty, signifying the countless women whose work goes unpaid. We displayed them in front of the year 2094, the year that wage parity will be achieved. COVID has pushed us back 35 years. At the entrance to the smaller bedroom was this mirror addressing body image issues. Reality check was hung opposite the door at eye level so that the viewer's face and body was reflected in the silhouette, driving home the point that the distorted female shape marketed to women as ideal is physically unattainable. This is me by Donna Jackson is a selection of self portraits she did to celebrate her birthday, one for every year of her life. In these drawings, she meditates on her personal development and celebrates herself and her journey thus far. The smallest bedroom was known as the prayer room. It was filled with artworks focusing on meditation, spiritual ascent, and healing vibration. Meditation portals and depictions of sound vibration patterns were subjects addressed by Dalia Reyes. Laura Lee Byatt made scrolls of acemic writing, a form of calligraphic meditation. Olivia Gooderson and I collaborated on this piece called The Ark of Our Mothers. Olivia was interested in making hair combs as contemporary crowns, ritual objects to adorn herself with power and intentionality. It was to signify the continuing energy and guidance of her ancestors. She drew the design and I made it for her from Paduke wood. We elevated it further by displaying it through a hamsa shaped window in this elaborately carved reliquary in the shape of a shield. It celebrates our shared Jewish heritage. And then lastly, <clears throat> we come to the womb. The largest bedroom was transformed into a womb big enough to walk through. From her core emanated the steady sound of a maternal heartbeat overlaid with sporadic digestive gurgling and bits of poetry read by artist Jessica DeMuro Graves. Crochet elements hung from the satin walls suggesting menstrual shedding. The overall effect was oddly comforting for most people, encouraging a primal sense of connection and gratitude. Jessica was newly pregnant at the time when the project began, but suffered a heartbreaking miscarriage in the midst of a woman house Detroit. The piece became a source of solace to her, a catharsis as she worked through the pain and the loss. And in closing, I will note that for each of the exhibits, um, we elected to forgo gallery style cards in favor of collecting the artist statements in the form of a map and guiding visitors as they explore the spaces. Um, and in that way, people could really take it with them when they left. Um, the words of the artists and their thoughts about the pieces that they made. So um, that's me taking you through um, the exhibit in a, in a quick little nutshell. And um, let me unshare. There. Um, and it, I just want to say again, what an amazing time it was um, to meet and work with um, and collaborate with all of these amazing artists. There was a certain energy and a, a sisterhood that formed there that was just fantastic. And it, it really feels like it'll be there for all of us for the, the, the ages. Um, I agree with that. Um, just, it was so, a very just to be in Asia's home to there was something about that and and just to see it go from thinking about it to a actual um, installation was beautiful too and then to and some of us know each other as you know just as people and as artists, but this may have been some, some of our first time actually working with each other as artists too. So that was a, another plus in that. So um, I think from here, if we could get a little bit more about your feel, feelings, Laura, about what you 
experience and then would like to get some of the other artists that are here to just talk about their experience too. So if you could do that. Sure. Um, so for me, it's always just an incredible pleasure to meet with women of this caliber and creative. The creativity was amazing. And when we would get together and we talk about, you know, what is it like being a woman today? What's on our minds? What's on our hearts? What, what do we feel like we might want to make work with, a uh, work about? Um, uh, I asked at one point, you know, people to set, to, to share, you know, what do you, what would be a win for you to get out of this, this whole um, project? And most people shared that they really wanted someone to collaborate with. Uh, they wanted to collaborate with other women. And so I made it a point to be available and to really open myself up to being a collaborator with as many of the artists as wanted to collaborate. And um, so being able to, to create alongside uh, and with so many different people was, was just so rich. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to point out too is that I've often uh, experienced more feminist kinds of spaces. And this one was much more of a blend of feminist and womanist space. And I loved that. It was so encouraging and uplifting. It, it felt um, like a championing of each other in, in a way that I hadn't experienced before. And um, I just, I still glow when I think about it. I'm like, it was such a fantastic experience, really. I agree. I think love and self-love and those kind of things were more, uh, more in the subjects of the works than probably what we saw in the original um, Woman House. But with that being said, I'm just going to pick like they do in school, like just pointing at people and let you go. <laughs> uh, I am going, I'm going to go with Sabrina Nelson, then Dahlia, and then Melanie Manos. Let's do it that way. Is that cool? I'd like to say Sabrina is our President's Awardee. WCA President's Awardee for Art and Activism. So thank you. Thank you. Can you yes. guys hear me open up before she got rolling? <laughs> thank you so much. Um, if I get interrupted, it's because I have my grandchildren for a week. Their parents are on some island enjoying their lives. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> and they're here with me for a week. So I'm, I'm doing GG duties. Um, thank you so much, Laura. Thank you so much, Laura. Thank you so much, Donna. Um, I think the experience was amazing. Um, well, not, I think, I know I am a womanist <laughs> who, um, grew up in a house with my grandmother, my great grandmother and my mother's, um, my first mother, my birth mother. I didn't call her mom. I called her Denise. She died in 1979. Her birthday was just, um, June 5th. And so she would have been 73. So I was 12. And after I turned 12, at the, at the end of 1979, I moved right down the street from that house on St. Mary's on the corner of Keeler and um, St. Mary's. So I was like five houses down from that house in 1979. Um, so it was really interesting to feel like there was a, a home going, if you would. We had many other moves after that, but you know, that was my mom's house, who is my mother's sister who really adopted us with my grandmother and just took care of us for our whole life. So it was nice to kind of be back in that bungalow, if you will, because those were bungalow houses. And when we moved over there, it was like a completely different world from where we moved from. And so the idea that, you know, there's always a going backness um, or a sankofa, if you will, for me, um, I don't believe in like things just haphazardly happening. I believe in divine timing and divine space. And um, what's really, really interesting is I knew Asia's mom was over there. And also my father died, uh, I would say like a week and a half before her mother. And I knew her mother was in the hospital right when my father had died. And I just talked to Asia about all the things that we were going through and we were trying to figure out and how to process um, that, but not, not grief, but just some of the things that have to be taken care of that no one really talks to you about when you deal with that kind of trauma. 
like, you know, whether or not you're going to have, because COVID was super, he died on April 28th. And I know um, Asia's mother died like May something, like it had to be within like six or seven days after my father had passed. And no one talks to you about not having a physical funeral or what you can do because COVID is here. So I just talked to her about all the things we, we um, did. And with Woman House, I was so busy processing um, the trauma of uh, the racial pandemic that was happening at the same time the viral pandemic was happening. And then I just realized that, okay, I can't change people. I can't stop people from doing things. But what I can do is work with the folks who are interested in knowing that some of us are not well. And how do we heal ourselves, our hearts, our minds, our bodies, and just thinking about how our grandmothers and great grandmothers dealt with trauma in the world or illness or, or, or grief. And so um, thinking about how they took care of us through the kitchen and through the bathroom because they didn't trust the medical centers. They didn't trust the hospitals. And that was because they didn't get the quality care when they grew up. So they knew that herbs, and things that they grew could heal them or the way that they ate or things that they did could heal them. So thinking about things in the bathroom and things in the kitchen and lavender and how Delta, cause I, my job requires that I fly a lot, right? And the Delta, um, you know, airline steward folks would always say, secure your mask first because you can't help anybody else, right? So I'm always thinking about how do I take care of me so I can take care of others? Right. Um, and so just thinking about the bath that I took days after my father died and I would just order myself um, fresh flowers weekly. And right when they started to wilt, I would take them off and put them in the tub and I would use lavender bath bombs. I would make lavender bath bombs. I'd use lavender oil and I would fix myself these really beautiful meals that I used to make for me and my father. But I would just eat them slowly. And I didn't have breakfast or break fast, as we call it. I ate breakfast very slow. And I just really just fed my body the love as if I were treating a patient. And so I wanted the bathroom to be that. Also, I understand that, you know, spiritualists talk about how water is the pathway between the living world and the non-living world. So I wanted to be in a space that had water because I wanted to um, honor the spirit of Asia's mother and honor the spirit of those of us that, you know, right now at this point, I think we've lost a million people um, to COVID, but you know, there's people that are dying every day that I consider a murder of crows or an unkindness of ravens, you know, whether it's black or brown people because people don't value their lives. So just thinking about how do we take care of the nurturer? How do we take care of ourselves as a womanist to say that women don't really take care of themselves as well as they do people in their community or in their family. So I wanted to kind of turn that back in to say, let's start thinking about how we take care of ourselves so that we are able to take care of others. And that's, that is what I was trying to do in the, in the bathroom, if you will, or the apothecary where the medicine comes from. I'm gonna stop talking now because the grandbabies are here. <laughs> Jesus is so upsetting. Grandbabies are always awesome, so whatever. <laughs> but well, but one thing that you you said, I mean, that space that you made in the bathroom was so. I mean, one to make an installation in a bathroom make it make you not think of the bathroom first of all. I mean, it was really just you could feel the the warmth and the spirituality of the space that you made. So I, that is definitely, a, um, it was a unique experience, but at the same time, very familiar because I do remember my mom taking me in bathrooms when you're not feeling well to, to make you feel better um, or her room, you know, that was the, uh, yeah. So um, I want to, Let's see, um, either I think I said Melanie then Dahlia or Dahlia then Melanie. I forget. I'm sorry. You said Dahlia. If go oh, Dahlia, go. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, um, thank you so much, Sabrina. That was beautiful. And I was happy to me and I think Laura and I were, were filling it up, filling up the tub with water. <laughs> Well, you were gone. <laughs> it was beautiful. It was, it was, uh, it was nice to be part of the ritual of the bathroom because it smelled amazing in there. And um, yeah, so we, um, I worked on the, uh, the prayer room inside of, I believe it was Asia's mother's um, prayer room. So <clears throat> right away, when I got to the space, I thought, how do I apply? Um, first of all, my, my um, what I focus on is typically meditation and metaphysical and kind of surreal imagery and ideas and cosmic things. And, um, but meditation being part, one of the really um, important parts of it and I thought well the prayer room is exactly that and how do I meld how do I honor um Asia's mother and also bring in some of you know the imagery that I've been working on and the idea of honoring um those that are leaving this realm and um that's kind of what the idea was with the prayer room there. So we created a space that you could meditate and then that the community could um, write a prayer or an affirmation, something, and then um, place it on the wall. And everybody um, after, I guess, towards the end of the like, um, woman house exhibition, there was, you know, a good amount of writings and then you just became in, engulfed in the beautiful writings and then Laura Lee's um, light language and um, all of it and then the gold leaves I think it was a really nice um, like a like a not like a shrine but like a just like a sacred space that we wanted to honor an already, an already sacred space that was, you know, more personal. And we opened it up to the community. And I just loved that so many people were a part of it. And to see that part, I think was really, really beautiful. That it wasn't just like, okay, here's, we're going to create this, but it was so, it was interactive. So I think that's really um, more than what we hoped for. And I was really happy about that and happy that it could contribute to a space that was already so sacred and was already so um, full of love and hope. And the energy was already there. And then so it was just really beautiful to be able to be a part of it. Yeah, it was great. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I, I stopped there every time I visited the space um, because it almost calls you in actually, um, that, that room. They all do in their own way, but um, it, it, it calls you in. So it's almost like I couldn't, past that space without. And the same thing with Sabrina's space too. It was just different. Um, I'm gonna say like when I passed your space, I felt like from the throat area, I was getting pulled that way. From heart area, getting pulled to Sabrina's, you know, and, and, and Jess's, you know, obviously. So you have these, there was these pulls that were happening. So I, I just think the word yeah. was brilliant. It, they were almost like chakras, if you will, like Absolutely. different chakras, like with Dahlia's space, I felt like, like when you go into a library or a sanctuary of a, a massive church, like you have to be quiet and you have to take your shoes off and you have to like, you know what I'm saying? So it felt like Absolutely. I had to take my shoes off when I walked in there. Mine, you could Absolutely. just smell lavender from 
downstairs. So it was sort of like it kind of the senses brought you up there. But with that space that Dahlia and, and Laura worked on, it was just so beautiful. And it didn't need a lot in it. You know, it was just really quiet, if you will. So it was sort of like a, a loud whisper, if there is a way to describe it. It so like describes Dahlia in a way. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, Melanie? Yeah, I want to know which body part was pulled for of you to mine. We were in the Oh, team. I can tell you. I can tell okay. you. Okay, go ahead. It's the, it's the body part that rec, rec, <laughs> that represents my pocketbook. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I, whatever body part that is, that's it. That's <laughs> I don't the know. One. <laughs> right on. Um, would it be all right uh, if I share a little of the video? Absolutely. Okay. Um, I have it. I think I have it queued here. Um, just so you get a kind of a better idea of what I'm talking about. Um, so this is what the installation looked like. You saw that from Laura's um, presentation. Was that a cedar closet too? Yeah. So I was going to oh, talk okay. about that. Um, Cause I absolutely love, oops, that's Arch Black. I was thinking about that. Um, so I did this piece as, um, I, when I, I won a Kresge, uh, fellowship and with that, um, Kresge and Detroit's artist award and so did Sabrina and, and, um, you could select a, congratulations. Artist. Oh, thank you. It was last year. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Anyway, so I connected with an artist, uh, Julia Yesbeck, whose um, video work, I'm a film, she's a filmmaker, and, and I know she works from a, a feminist viewpoint just in terms of her being a filmmaker, and I was really interested in her style, and so we connected. And um, I had made this before seeing the house, but um, in looking around the house, so I'll stop, well, I'll let it go a little bit more. Um, it gets kind of frantic, but in looking at the house, um, I was really interested in that, the, like the legacy of the house and the heritage of it. Um, but I felt like I would need to spend a, a lot more time to actually kind of listen to the house to make something for me that directly responded to the space, and I love working site specifically like that, but it was also a group show. So um, when I saw the cedar closet, it connected me to, uh, we had a cedar closet in the, um, the older house that I grew up at, in outside of Detroit. And um, it, I would go in there for refuge. <laughs> And a lot of it was um, like um, my mother's beautiful things that were there. And when I made this um, film, I've been thinking a lot about, as you saw with like the gender gap dildos, um, that the just the economic precarity that women have and the lack of support um, financially, I mean monetarily for caregiving. Um, and so many other things. And so I knew that my mother had been, had wanted a family, but also really loved her professional life. And um, at the, that, in that decade, and it's not that different now, unfortunately, not to be like a, a, a negative Nelly here, but um, very difficult to do both. She just didn't think it was possible. And I don't think it probably, I mean, she ended up having three kids, but she was, she did so much for us as a mother, but she kind of had to put that professional life into the closet. And um, so for me, um, I was really thinking of Woman House as the legacy of Asia and her mother, because I don't know that much about the rest of your family, Asia. And it, it just, that just feels like the, the, the center of the home. Uh, um, the, the female legacy. And so that's kind of how I related to it with that piece. I did struggle with trying to decide how to have the um, different elements in, in the space. 
And in some ways, I'd almost like the video. I always think about, well, what would I do if I were to do it again? And in some ways, I'd almost like it to be like, you don't necessarily see the video uh, unless you like um, move the clothes, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and then it's a, a discovery because it's so kind of in the background, it's so hidden. Um, but it was kind of nice, you come around the corner and it was a focal point when, once you got upstairs. So that's where I was coming from. I, I really appreciated the work that everyone did and also really appreciate um, Donna, you bringing up womanism. Um, it really um, got me thinking more about that and almost as a, a pushback to using the term feminism and um, it's you've made me more aware of that. So I really appreciate that. Oh, no problem. I think part of my job is to push back. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, I Melanie, I just want to say I really appreciate your installations from the time I I think I first met you at the pickle factory. Oh, yeah, I love you. Sabrina had the best installation there, too. It was so good. That was was that ten years ago or more? God, I hate. I don't know. It was with the Dashboard Cooperative, two female curators that are doing some really great shows, and they came to Detroit. Yeah, they're out of Atlanta, I think. But you know, I've I've really always liked your perspective because you you've always used um, the video um, at, or film work as a, a caveat to what we're looking at and I can't remember was it a car mirror or it was something really small like a rear view mirror if you will just kind of looking at the way that you were processing a moment and this is also another processing of a moment through another lens and so I really appreciate um I just think the the ladder on rocker is brilliant I mean I, just being in woman house in general with Laura and her brilliant self and her husband and his, just his tools. I was just so happy that I was like, oh my God, how am I gonna mount these medicine cabinets in this bathroom that already has a medicine cabinet? Yeah, so, shout out to feminist men or allies. Right? Yeah. Or womanist men, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, womanist so, men, yeah, thank you. So I just oh, thank um, you, wanted Sabrina. to say, I really, really appreciated your installation in that cedar closet. And then the idea that that's where you identified your mother's beautiful things. Um, but that's where things are that are um, that we hold so dear are kept so that the moths don't eat them, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so just thinking about the idea that we're holding the the space for for equity in that cedar closet so that the moths don't eat it because it's so important to us. You know, that's where the valuables are kept, if you will. And so, Thank and you for, for that. me. It was a thank you so much, Sabrina. And for me, as a child, it was a destination space and like a safe space. Yeah. But it, it kind of felt that way too. There was two things I felt about that the space, like knowing you and seeing that space. It's like all of the creative and all of the thought of Melanie could never fit in that closet. Like that was part of. I mean, this is. There's not enough space for Melanie, but then to hear that that's where you, a destination for you, is so, that's so weird to hear. It's like, you can't fit in there. Come out, come out of the closet. <laughs> um, okay. Okay, see, she's, she's out, y'all, she's out. Um, but with all of that, I mean, I'll say this and then we can open up the questions or we can just keep talking because most of us are were part of it. But um, I, I, I think I met Laura through the Manchester Home Exhibition. Um, and I met Asia. Asia was one of the first, this is now over 10, 11 years ago when I got into doing installations myself, one of the first people that opened her doors to saying, yes, you can display and show here. So to have these two women meet and this to come out of it, and then again, to have space for all of these different ideas to come together, that was, that was probably 
one of the things I love most about it. I love all of the spiritual experiences that I had in that home, which um, also gave me a confirmation as why I came back to Detroit, where you could go to all these different places to live, but I came back home because there's something about the groundingness of the people here that make me want to stay here. Um, and it, it was just a really, really good experience to do it with, with women, with females, and with so many of so many different backgrounds and thoughts and experiences. So that's that's what I got out of this. So I will kind of like to just and let me go back to one more thing. I, I would be amiss not to say this. As Laura said, and also as Asia stated, um, the the earlier rendition of this was um, very, very academic, very white. And um, to have a chance to show what this would look like with a more diverse uh, group of women, mostly women of color, um, women of urban backgrounds, I, I, I felt like that was needed. And again, to see how it's grounded in spirituality also made me feel very, I mean, that, that was very unique that I did not see from the initial um, iteration of the home. So very, very first applaud for that. And I hope someone will look back at this iteration and say, what, what can we add? What other voices do we need for women, for people to understand womanism and feminism and urbanism and, and blackness and, and culture, whether we're Hispanic or Arabic or, or Polish or Jewish or whatever, like all of that is mixed up in this home and, 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 and that's because of Asia and her family giving us the space to do it. So it's, it was a very good and, and would love to do it again at some point. So with that, I'll open it up or what, however you do this, Laura Morrison. All right, I'll start with the questions. <laughs> so um, first of all, a couple practical ones. How long did, did the show um, was the show open? We were we were open for uh, about a month and a half, I believe, if I remember right. And um, so I'm assuming you got a lot of foot traffic to it. Was it open all day? I mean, what were your hours just the weekends or? Yeah, and by appointment. I mean, it was in COVID, so we had to regulate the amount of people who were in the home at any given time. Mm -hmm. So we actually set it up on Eventbrite so that people could reserve times to be in the house. And um, and then by appointment, so if people knew they had a particular party, we could make special arrangements for them. Yeah. Oh, sounds good. Um, then, then on the opposite end, how long did the project take to create? Like from the time you started the, the, the meetings to the time you opened? In this case, it was very brief um, because yeah, Asia and I started talking about her vision for wanting uh, an artist residency space. It was in the springtime. And wow. by the time we actually put together a list and consulted with Donna to expand our list and then reached out and invited people, it was summer. So we, we kept a fairly short window um, and we had a few conversations as a group, primarily on Zoom. And, and it was during a time when we had these horrible floods. I remember uh, Sabrina really got the brunt of that one. Um, anyway, so it was a challenging time. So we ended up doing a lot of our conversations on Zoom. Uh, and then moving fairly quickly into ideation with a shared inspiration board online that everybody could look at in their own convenience, and then moving into the space itself. Um, and uh, one, everything changes, of course, once you get into the space itself, because the space is, I mean, the house was as much a part of this whole exhibition as, as any of the artwork, it, it, as Melanie was 
you know, speaking about earlier, you know, it had a presence about it already. And um, so once we got to the space, uh, I, you know, I, I'm always trusting that somehow it's all going to be amazing, right? I don't know who's going to make what kind of work. I don't know how it's all going to play out, but I just knew in my heart of hearts, it was going to be great. And as we got together and we shared stories and um, associations that we had with different components of domestic life in different aspects of the house and what we were gravitating toward personally, it just really fell into place quite quickly who, you know, was going to be activating which spaces. I did ask everybody to put their first, second, third choice. And I love Sabrina's, the bathroom, the bathroom, the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but everybody got their first or second choice and um and people you know really they were so thoughtful they were so inventive they were so they worked so beautifully together and um and it was it's just it was an honor to be a part of it great um and my last question is about your consciousness raising because i know that was a huge part of the original women house and so i guess my thought is like was there some sort of template or format you kind of used to do that? Or did you just kind of wing it? Um, you know, how, it was a combination. Yeah, so consciousness raising in the 1972 version, um, because they were in an academic setting, those artists had carved out a significant portion of their lives to be available for that project. And they went to that house and they lived together in that space. And so they were able to develop um, through consciousness raising, which was an adaptation that Judy Chicago made of her father, who was the labor organizer, um, used to invite the entire community to come and sit around the table and then go around the table repeatedly again and again and again to hear what was on everyone's minds <clears throat> until it became evident what the agenda really needed to be that needed to be addressed by the community. And so it's basically raising your consciousness of what's on people's hearts and minds. And so we did an adaptation of that, but I also combined it because we had a shorter period of time that we could spend together and the challenges of, you know, COVID in general. Um, I would do things like what I call a silent brainstorm and just ask people to quickly brainstorm on, on post-it notes. What are all the things that you're bringing to this meeting that you want to make sure get covered. And in that way, I would at least have a record of where everybody came into the meeting. And then we would go around either the Zoom screen or around the, the meeting in person and just hear what was on everyone's minds about what they wanted to do with the house. And, um, and even though we had much briefer period of time, and of course, we're talking about women who are um, holding down jobs, raising families, caring for elderly people. These are not college students. We have full, full lives. In some ways that made us less available, but in some ways that made us incredibly astute with, with how we spend our time. Um, so when we were together and talking about these things, I felt like we came to uh, an understanding of, of how the house should evolve. Um, and, and really very quickly. And, um, and I applaud this particular first group of artists. I mean, when Asia and I sat down and talked about, you know, installation is a different animal than many other kinds of forms of art. And it takes a certain, you know, chops to do that. And so when we put together our first pass of, you know, who, who could step into this role and who has, who has that kind of um, experience. And then we, we took our list and went to Donna and she helped flesh it out even more. Um, you know, that's a that's a particular kind of artist who can step into that space. And so it was lovely to see that even with a short lead time, people were comfortable. We had we had the right mix. We, it was like we curated the the team rather than the space essentially. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, I can you created a sisterhood, if you will, because some of the artists I had not I had not, um, I had heard of the, the two artists that were in the kitchen and the dining room. I had heard of them before, but I had never really been in a physical space with them. And so I'd seen their work. Melanie and I had met 10 years prior. Donna and I were in a show that was at the Scarab Club and, you know, she's been kind of moving around. And so, and Laura Lee and I are in the pioneer building together as artists, but I hadn't met everybody in the building because COVID. So mm -hmm. it was it was interesting to now 
to now be the sisters, if you will, from Woman House, because now we all have a connection um, of each other. And even the artist who didn't really get to finish her work in the garage because it had um, some issues with, uh, I think, holes in it, but knowing her and her work and knowing that she started off in architecture yeah, and um, really, she's a really, good friend really of that. my sisters. And then to see her kind of want to stage this space outside of the house, but connected to the house. And she had really, really great ideas and intentions. It just didn't work out physically. Um, but now we have this, this group of women now, you know, that we can say we were the first, I guess the first group of woman house Detroit. And now maybe we can visual, we can visit it annually or something, but now the family is growing with the second group now there. So I really appreciate um, being on that list. I really, really do. Cause I, I just feel like everybody who was there, there there's a level of brilliance. You know, Dahlia runs a gallery, Asia runs a gallery too. So they're gallerists and sometimes curators, but they're also artists first, right. you know, and so, with Dahlia being in the prayer room and creating that portal to kind of take you into a sacredness. And then also Jessica's womb being right across with that heartbeat. It's sort of like, you know, your heart chakra and then your spirituality is right there, you know? And then um, bringing in the space with the gold leaf and the books and the feathers, it just, it was just so beautiful, everything that was done. So I appreciate being in there with the group of women and being curated, if you will, in that group. Oh, one thing I would say is I think this was the one place where COVID may have been a, a silver lining. I don't know if, the, if it wasn't for that, would we have been able to do it as fast, as good with our full lives? I'm not sure. So everything has its place, like Sabrina said earlier. Um, and, uh, you know, I I hadn't, I'm always stalking artists. Some of y'all are. are <laughs> <laughs> I am. Oh, that was you. I'm, yeah, I was in Dahlia's uh, gallery all the time, just writing down names, like, <laughs> yep. <laughs> but, but that was what, so for me, it was kind of like, dream come true to actually get to work with with Dahlia and with Rosa. I mean, her photography is just amazing, right? And to work with, I mean, these are women I, I, I've been secretly, Sabrina too, you know, been secretly wanting to work with. And then it's like, oh, gotcha. We're going, we're about to do this. So, um, it, it was really nice that years of knowing people had finally got that dream to happen in that house, which now we have a second iteration of a second round of beautiful black and brown women from Detroit, from all these backgrounds that are going to continue this work. And um, I wish I would have seen this as a black artist when I was coming up. Um, there weren't a lot, and and now we're showing that there. You weren't are. supposed to see it. You weren't supposed to see it because you um, had to create it. Look, Toni uh, Morrison says if there's a book you want to read and it's not there, you got to write it. So you did what you were supposed to do. <laughs> awesome. That's Sabrina. That's what we were talking about. Love it. <laughs> love it. But, I wanted to uh, add something. If 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 yeah, this is okay time, ahead. I was thinking. Um, about some of the work on the first floor and um, how powerful it was. Um, Amelia's work um, and Rosa Maria really talking about the Latinx experience. I, I really appreciated um, how they did that. Amelia's was also a connection to her father yeah. um, and his work, um, but just the way they both inhabited the space and correct me if I'm wrong on that, but uh, Laura, 
but that's that's what I understood. It was his printmaking background, and then her she put a lot of that up. And then Rosa Maria with her mother's legacy, I thought was very interesting. But they also had a real strong socio political undertone, both of those, or even overtone, you know. And um, I appreciated that they did that so boldly. And um, God, I'm really sorry. I'm forgetting about the photographs in the windows. Not the in the windows in the living room. Yeah, Laura Lee by it. Laura Lee. Yeah, I was gonna. I'm glad you said it because I almost pronounced your name wrong. Um, those were just so impactful in thinking about. You don't know it at first when you see them, but then thinking about how she's talking about the destructive part of families or the 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 fear. Like some a woman can be afraid in her own house. And um, I just really appreciate that these artists also brought that. It's it's interesting. I don't know if you thought of it this way, Laura. I, I think that you work on a lot of levels because you really trust, which is great. It was like some of those things that were very somber. Um, and I know that they connected to the rooms, especially with Rosa Maria, but um, you know, on that lower level and then kind of rising up spiritually, maybe except for mine, but mine was in the closet. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, I, and then Asia having the piece in the, and also on the floor and the back and the, um, then Asia's piece. I just love that black and white piece with the, the two people pointing at each other. It's just fantastic, I thought. And then her piece in the living room where it was just a dress that was, had been her mother's on a chair. I mean that could please that piece could hold the space itself I thought yeah so um, kudos to you Laura and also um, your partner Rich for the that she didn't talk about it but they did so much tweaking and um, craft to make a lot of the installations actually happen whether it was just like lifting something up I needed a little more height on mine and Laura whipped out a, a shelf that we could you know um, screw in to the wall and just a lot of those kind of curatorial details that are actually sometimes more in the preparator side and um, they came through with that so I definitely want to give you kudos for that yeah okay, okay. Yes, yes thank, thank you, you so much, much. pass it along to Rich he's going to love you know, that we think of him as a womanist man <laughs> <laughs> There's, you know, we can still work on something. I'm kidding, but. <laughs> we all can, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. I kid. Uh, oh, there's a deer wonder... in your yard. Oh, fabulous. Beautiful deer. He's at my house and I'm somewhere else. Anyway, um, I did want to say too, that it is true. Asia has asked me to, to do Woman House again this year and hopefully in the fall. So we're talking right now about um, you know, which people will, will be working in the house. And um, as Sabrina was saying, you know, growing the family. So I'm all excited about it. I, I can't wait to, to see how the next conversation evolves. So Very exciting. I'm happy to know it's continuing. It was my, one of my questions was, was, you know, Asia just going to do this this once and maybe she had to sell off the house or something, but she's um, dedicated to, to keeping it so that this can keep happening. Well, the house yeah. is also, no, the house is a, an artist residency okay. year round now. That, yeah. And this kind of helped too. get that going. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah. And she got a, a, a good size grant to help keep that going. She's really rocking it in That's Detroit right. with both the gallery and the residency. Yeah. Great. Great. Well, do we have uh, anything else to add? Um, no, I'm going to say this because I can't not say it about <laughs> my city of Detroit that I love so dearly. Um, one reason why Asia is had to leave is because she she hustles so hard to ensure not only um, legacy of herself, but legacy of artists, women artists, um, artists of color. Um, that stamp she wants people to have um, opportunity and if 
I, and I and that's what she's doing for sure um, in in this city. And there are there aren't a lot of Asians. And I'm not gonna say that, but um, there are a lot of very people with that mindset here to understand if we don't give ourselves opportunity, um, no one will. And then just that loving spirit of, yes, I want to bring you along and you bring someone along. And that's something I hope that I'm bringing to WCA too. So uh, I, yeah, she's, a, she's a beautiful, all of you all are, but Asia's a beautiful spirit. I'm glad to meet her, met her. Well, thank you. All right, everyone. Well, I think this concludes the Woman House Detroit. This was amazing. I'm wondering, Laura, if you could send me a PDF of your slide presentation, we can kind of include that because that was um, really nice to see as well. And um, thank you so much. This has been amazing. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Yes, thank you too, Laura. Oh, so much. All right, <laughs> take care everyone. Give a pause and take care. Have a good rest of your evening. You too. Thank you. Bye ladies. Thank you so Bye. much. Bye, everyone. Bye, Bye Sabrina. <laughs> <laughs>